Did you know that Trafalgar Law was first introduced during the Skypiea arc? It's absolutely insane, but if you look at the cover of chapter 257 and manage to rip your eyes past the ever magnificent Warpole, then in the background, you can see a young Trafalgar Law. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam, but that kid's name is not Trafalgar Law. It's a crazy detail though, because this kid's design, six years of real lifetime later, would be used to garb our pre-time skip Trafalgar Law. Seriously, the child even looks like he has the goatee and everything, it is beyond wild. And One Piece is jam packed full of details like this that most fans never notice, many of which are significantly more mind blowing and relevant. And if you've not read the 1000 plus chapters or watched the 1000 plus episodes many multiples of times, then you are going to miss these finer points. But that's why you have me, the guy who does the things. In fact, the only thing you need to do is subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed. Also some sad yet happy Happy news, but September is officially complete, primarily due to the fact that it is now October. However, I am thrilled to announce that through new subscribers, direct donations, and the fundraiser video, we have raised a grand total of $11,448 redues for Make-A-Wish Australia. So thank you very much to everyone who got involved and that money is going to make some real dreams come true. And of course, make sure to subscribe to the Grand Line Review regardless, and please do say hi in the comments if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. But we are going to start with a big, small detail though. And this one, when I heard it, it's one of those things that just made me go, whoa. So, Fleet Admiral Sakazuki. You may know him as the man who killed Ace, threatened to kill Kobe, and who promptly soiled himself when confronted by Shanks. And most fans will probably know him better as Akainu, but that is just a sneaky epithet, and Sakazuki is his real name. Which is very important because it's probably one of the most painfully well-chosen names in the series. Sakazuki is a surprisingly one kanji word, and it refers to the ritual exchange of sake cups, a very common Yakuza practice, which can be done in one of two ways. One is an equal exchange to bring people together as siblings, whilst another would be to enter a master-servant style relationship, which is probably a lot less kinky than it sounds. A great example of the latter ritual would be the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, who initially pledged themselves to Luffy via a Sakazuki ritual. Meanwhile, an example of the former would obviously be Luffy, Ace, and Sabo, who became brothers via Sakazuki. And this is where things get super twisted now, because not only did they become brothers by Sakazuki, but their brotherhood was also severed by a Sakazuki. Luffy's brother was taken away by a man representing the very thing that had brought them together. And it gets worse, like a lot worse, because when we think about Sabo's amnesia, all of a sudden this makes a lot of sense. The way this event is portrayed in the series is Sabo hearing Ace's death and things just, you know, sort of clicking. That's not it though. It is so much more sinister because Sabo doesn't just read about the death of Ace, he also reads that Ace was killed by Sakazuki whilst protecting Luffy. So in one news article, Sabo sees these three words, Ace, Luffy, Sakazuki. Bam, all of a sudden Sabo remembers the brotherhood he forged just in time to watch it crumble apart before his very eyes. And I know I say this a lot, but this like legitimately mind blew me because it means that Oda named Sakazuki pretty much exclusively for the purpose of Sabo, an entire Marine Admiral named just to build the story of a character that we had no idea even existed until after the events of Marineford. And in many ways, his name should probably be anti-Sakazuki. So now what we need to see is Sabo killing anti-Sakazuki, which would make him an anti-anti-Sakazuki, thus restoring the original Sakazuki, and Ace, well, Ace would still be dead, but it might be a nice thing to do anyway, you know? However, not all subtle details are meticulously planned, or in fact, planned at all. And this next one is a great example of something that just went impossibly right. So there is a particular soundtrack in One Piece, which I can't play for you for annoying copyright reasons, but you have definitely heard it before. It's the soft piano track that plays whenever something super sad happens in the anime. It goes something like this. Da, 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 dun, dun, dun. I don't know, I can't do it. That sounds nothing like that. I can't, I can't do it, I am not a music. But for example, it's the extremely sad song that plays over Whitebeard's final moments during the Paramount War, where he's thinking about his crew and his dreams of having a family and ah, oh, oh, it's so emotional. The song itself doesn't necessarily matter though. What matters is the title. And are you ready for this? Because the title of that track is called Gold and Odin. 
And this is something that is too perfect to overlook. In this modern day, you cannot put those two words together without referencing Goldie Roger and Kozuki Odin. But the wild thing is that this song existed long, long, long before we were introduced to Odin. And in fact, it existed long before it was used to underscore Whitebeard's death. And you know what? It even existed before we met Tony, Tony Chopper. Because Gold and Odin was composed for the very first One Piece movie, which was released in the year 2000. And it was named Gold and Odin because the main villain of that film, El Dorago, had a gold obsession. And the emotional center of the film was about a young boy and his grandfather who owned a floating Odin shop, hence Gold and Odin. However, 21 years later, this track is still being used in the anime. And the title by sheer cosmic coincidence now appears to reference the relationship between two of the most important characters who have ever lived in the story. This is just one of those real life events that's crazier than any fiction could be. Although maybe not quite as crazy as El Dorago's unreasonably high shorts in the film. I mean, come on, those shorts are higher than Smoker on April 20th. For something sneakier and a bit more intentional now, did you know that One Piece exists within One Piece? which is a very Inception style statement to make, but that's exactly what it is. During the beginning of the Little Garden arc, Nami searches frantically for a book because there's this nice little quaint library aboard the Going Merry, and within that library is a book labeled One Piece. Huh. How about that? And not only that, but right next to it is another book labeled Echiro Oda, which assumedly is a biography of the author of One Piece. So we have something of a conspiracy on our hands here because one of the Straw Hats is a literal One Piece fan and my money is on Usopp. It just explains so much. Usopp read One Piece and that's why all of his lies keep coming true because he knows what's going to happen. And just a disclaimer before people inevitably take me seriously. I don't know why anyone takes me seriously. I don't actually believe this though, this is just a fun thing that exists. It's irrelevant, like most of the things that I talk about. <laughs> As does shipping. I mean, it's more or less fun, depending on who you are. I'm not the biggest fan of it myself. However, there was a rather infamous occasion of a quote unquote official ship crafted by Oda. So here we have a sketch of Luffy holding a suspiciously Nami looking baby. And this pops up every now and then in the fandom as evidence of Oda's approval of the Luffy Nami pairing. However, in this thing that we call reality, this was drawn as a tribute to Oda's editor at the time, Takuhiro Habuta, who had just produced a daughter spawn. Although, and this, this is just my speculation, but I suspect that it was Habuta's wife who actually gave birth to the child. Now, speaking of giving birth, and well, I think I've picked a pretty tricky transition line there, haven't I? Um, hmm. Uh, speaking of giving birth, did you know that the name on Sanji's birth certificate is actually listed as Stupid Cook? Because that's what Zoro thinks. And here's Sanji something that often goes quite under the radar, but Zoro has never once referred to Sanji by his actual name. Meanwhile, the inverse is not true. Sanji usually refers to Zoro as some sort of Marimo or shitty swordsman. However, there are definitely cases where Sanji has used Zoro's name. And we know this courtesy of a reader who painstakingly went through the series and added up the amount of times that Zoro and Sanji have referred to each other. And as of volume 73, Sanji has apparently used Zoro's name a pretty incredible 14 times, while Zoro has used Sanji's name 14 times times less than that. However, some controversy now, because this is not consistent between translations. In the Viz Manga edition, there exists a special editor's note claiming that in their English version, Zoro has used Sanji's name for the sake of context. So uh, very scandalous there. Weirdly enough, in the anime though, Zoro does use Sanji's name a handful of times for better no reasons. And I have to say that it's just weird listening to Zoro's Japanese voice uttering those syllables. So please make it stop. But continuing with with the naming topic, here's a slightly depressing one. But have you ever stopped and considered Baby Five? One Piece is full of weird names, but this one is particularly off and potentially very tragic as well, because as we know, she was abandoned by her mother who repeatedly labeled her as being useless. Hence the whole being useful complex. Legitimately, one of the darkest backstories in One Piece that we always overlook for, for some reason. But one train of thought goes a shade darker than this and proposes that Baby Five's mother was so uncaring about her children that she didn't even bother to give them names. So the first child was simply baby one, the second baby two, and so on until baby five, and potentially even into the future with baby six, seven, and eight. Maybe even more, depending on how frequently this mother reproduced her allegedly useless children. Now I should say that apparently baby five did reveal her actual name as a child to Law and Buffalo, but this doesn't take away from that thought because it could simply mean that she has a family name and then her first name is baby five. Sort of like how Trafalgar Law's real name is Trafalgar Law, just with some more and a big old D in the middle, which to me sounds like the world's worst cup of tea. Here's a question 
question for you though. If I asked you to tell me which character has appeared on the most volume covers of One Piece, you'd probably say Luffy, yeah? And for good reason, because you would be right. Good on you, who's a clever viewer, it's you. But what if I was to ask which character has appeared on the second most amount of volume covers? Your mind brain would probably wander through all sorts of possibilities like say Zoro, Zami, or even maybe Zonji. But all of those are wrong on several levels because the character who has appeared on the second most amount of volume covers is actually Panda Man. This sneaky dude guy is absolutely everywhere. But the trick is, and you would never notice this on the English volumes because their covers are like this nice thick piece of cardboard. Whereas in Japanese, all of the volume volumes come with dust covers. And if you look underneath these covers, well, you generally find a nice fun panda surprise. And the Panda Man lore in the series, which is generally played out in secret on volume covers, runs so much deeper than you could ever imagine. Through these covers, we have learned that Panda Man has several enemies pursuing him throughout the world, such as the debt collector Tomato Gang, as well as Panda Man's ultimate rival, Unforgivable Mask. And within this lore also exists a love interest being Panda Woman, although it is currently unknown if she hold mutual feelings. And furthermore, are pandas, are they even capable of love? Well, according to research, no, no, they are not. Apparently pandas are very solitary and selfish creatures that don't construct any meaningful relationships at all. Very much assuming the sociopath role within the animal kingdom. They come together to mate and then they discard one another. So in many ways, pandas are quite similar to Big Mom. They exist purely as babby production factories, and once your usefulness to them has expired, you will end up as a turnip in the ground. However, back to something moderately more relevant. Very excitingly, we have recently confirmed that Panda Man is in fact a mink, because on the cover of volume 98, you can actually see him in his glorious Sulong form. Also, for whatever reason, an integral aspect of the Panda Man lore involves this creature, which we've actually seen in the canon of the series, because this is a long bear, which we encountered on Long Ring Longland. But a lot of people know about the Panda Man sightings in the series or even the volume covers, but here is the true secret. Now what people seriously neglect is the back of the volume covers because you probably can't see this on camera, you can confirm. Can't see, crap, but this is where the bulk of the Panda Man story plays out. Such as the back of volume 54 where it is revealed that Panda Man may or may not have been abducted by aliens. Aliens do exist in One Piece, by the way, like lots of aliens, but that is a topic for another time. Meanwhile, here's a topic for right now, because there's always more to learn, explore, and experience with this wonderful series, so I look forward to seeing you there.